Yeah, hi. So this is a talk about concurrency techniques uh, for services. Um, so as you know, if you have a large monolithic application, uh, one of our biggest central applications is a monolith. And with concurrency, we can sort of, you know, kind of dip into concurrency when we want. We want a bit of extra parallelism, or we want to speed something up or not block something. Uh, but as you embrace a more service, microservice architecture, concurrency stops being a nice thing you can dip into and starts becoming mandatory. Uh, you have to start dealing with uh, services on a bigger scale, more abstraction and everything else. And so dealing with that is going to be the talk today. Uh, who are we? The plug. Uh, we're Cudini, and as you can tell by our 1990s guitar toting duke, uh, we're a Java shop, we're recruiting. Yeah. And our website's on GitHub, just Cudini, Q-U-D-I-N-I. -I. Uh, it rhymes with Houdini because you escape the Q. Yeah, I know. Um, and the point ahead boss website is kudin.com, which is our new WordPress website. Um, and I'll just give a few words to Fraser Hardy. Hi there. Uh, so, yeah, I'm CTO and co founder of Kudini. Um, so, I'll just do the bit of marketing speak. Uh, so, we've been going for um, just coming up to six years now. Um, we're based over in Shoreditch. We've got a team of about 14 engineers at the moment. Um, as Liz said, we're, we're mo mostly Java shop. Um, we built um, the bulk of Kudini um, on Play Framework. Um, back actually when we very first started, it's Play One. Um, so we've kind of built up a pretty big monolith, but we're now breaking that down into some microservices, um, actually dipping our toe into the, the spring as well now. Um, and yeah, effectively we're a queue management system, a booking system for big retailers all over the world. So we now process um, upwards of about two million customers through the platform each month. Um, that's actually more than doubled in the last six months just to give you an idea of the amount of growth we're going through right now. Um, so we're kind of expanding internationally, uh, spinning up more and more kind of, um, or more and more customers and more and more um, features as well. So we've got quite a, quite a lot of interesting technical challenges uh, ahead of us. Um, and I'll hand over to Lewis to uh, talk you through uh, the internet of concurrency. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. So, to say what I said before, um, to state the obvious, microservices are inherently concurrent. So, Dipping into concurrency works great in a large system, just saying, oh, I'll do that in a background thread, or I'll trip that into an executor service. But when you're doing services, it's a whole different kettle of fish. You have to actually start not just spinning things off in background threads, but you have to start composing and abstracting things. And you have to start ratcheting up the abstraction, because if you don't, um, the complexity will just end up bogging down the whole team. So. We're going to be talking about these today. Uh, we're going to be talking about the really established trends on the JVM, which is using threads as tasks directly, as in I want to do something, so thread.start. Uh, thread pooling. We're going to be talking about the neural things, such as completable futures in Java 8. And we're going to be talking about metaprogramming and instrumentation, which has been around for a while. And we're also going to discuss the emerging trends, so reactive streams with things like Project Reactor and RX Java, and actors provided by Acker. This talk isn't going to cover distributed message queues because although they are a great way of kind of orchestrating events between separate services, um, those are already really well covered by other talks. Um, and I wanted to cover some uh, concurrency constructs that are kind of limited to one JVM at a time, um, although have the capability to spread across more. And although data stores can be used to um, do concurrency between instances, like pushing an event and then re um, subscribing to them, we're not going to cover those either. So the established practices uh, that have been around since year dot are threads as tasks and thread pooling. And the idea, like, when you, if you read a really early Java book from the 90s or early noughties, they always don't, they don't treat threads as a hairy implementation detail of concurrency. They treat them as tasks. So anyone who wants to do something, they do new thread start, dot start, and they do stuff. So the traditional model, for example, let's assume you have a web service, as I'm sure most of you do is to take a task such as a request going from beginning to end and then to simply say, well, it's a thread. And if the request blocks on the database connection, we block the thread. It's easy. Um, and the advantage, of course, of um, native threads that Java got in 1.1, I believe, is that then if you have multiple processor calls, it can just um, parallelize itself across all of them. So it works pretty well for the time. But then we thought, well, actually, individual threads are pretty expensive to spin off for every single request. It's not quite as bad as the old forking a process in the Pulse CGI days, but it's still not great. Uh, so why don't we try pooling them together? And pooling them together not only gives you performance benefits from um, being able to reuse threads, it also gives you a tool for abstraction, because then you can start reasoning about things like, oh, how do I schedule things? Do I use a fork join? Do I use a work stealing algorithm? 
So this isn't just a performance optimization, this also gives you abstraction capabilities you didn't have before. And uh, yeah, I, that, I, got, I got a lot of Wikipedia. Um, newer practices, completion stages and completable futures. Um, just out of interest, how many of you are running on Java 8 now for your main applications? Um, quite a few of you. Okay, so completable futures, for those of you who don't know, are a bit like Java's futures, but they have more uh, monadic ways of composing things together. So with a Java 7 future, you can say, get this, or if it's not done, then just block waiting for it, which is a good low-level building block, but you can't really compose things at a high level, so they added completion stages and completable futures. Um, and this is an example um, in one of our apps, and as you can see, it's, you know, it's not as readable as old-fashioned thread-based code, but it still has a basic uh, linear structure. You don't have callback hell. Uh, there we're doing something that's, um, that something takes a while, so then we compose, and then we wait for something else, and we wait for something else. Um, it's not the height of readability, which is the point I'm going to come to in a bit, but it works, um, and it doesn't involve callback hell or deeply nested anonymous in the classes. So it is definitely an improvement, and uh, there's the type on Java doc. The other thing which has been around for quite a while is metaprogramming and bytecode tricks. Now, to paraphrase Jamie Zawinski, some people, when confronted with the problem, think, I know, I'll use code instrumentation, and now they have two problems. And we use, uh, as Fraser pointed out, we use Play Framework 1, and you know, it's a good framework, but it has this trick where if you use the await method, it uses code instrumentation to like, inject a continuation into your code that then gets yielded back up to the router using a runtime exception which is really nice because it means you can write synchronous code but then uh, have it non-blocking, which is awesome, until you try to debug stuff and then you end up with stuff like this and it's just really not fun. Um, so instrumentation does definitely alleviate some of the problems but the costs, I would argue, are too high uh, unless you're using Clojure and you do it with macros but that's a whole other talk. Um, so yeah, let's discuss the emerging practices, reactive streams and actors. So there are two things which are quite big in programming. One of them is promises, or futures, if you will. The idea is that you have something, but you don't have it yet. You have it at some point in the future. You don't know when. It may not, not even turn up. It may throw an error. You don't know. But the point is, you're dealing with it as if, as if it exists now, but it actually doesn't exist now. Another thing you have in programming is, uh, in newer languages, is generators. So you have multiple things. The thing about generators is, you can't say, give me any amount of future things in the future. With generators, if someone pulls or yields, you need to give them a value straight away. So what, um, what reactive streams do is they kind of merge the concepts together. Like futures, you can say it's happening in the future, but like streams, you can say, oh, but it's not just one thing, it's going to be multiple things in the future. Um, yeah, so it's same fundamental idea as futures, but just multiple of them. And it's kind of quite like the Java 8 stream API, so you can do filtering, mapping, skip while, take, all that stuff. And yeah, here's an example in one of our newer Spring Reactive projects. Um, as you can see, it's not quite as readable as old-fashioned thread code, but it's not too deeply nested, and it's still reasonably concise. We have operations um, that are accessing JPA, which is sadly blocking, so we have to do thread pooling, which I won't go into for now. And then we have other things that potentially block. We have an S3 object service there. AWS, of course, will block when you have to look things up on S3. Um, but eventually it's still, you know, flatly nested, it's still kind of readable, um, mm. albeit less readable than it was before. I'd like to say that we embraced this because we saw the potential of reactive streams, but actually we did it because Spring Reactive kind of forced us to, because we're using Webflux now for some of our newer things. But once we had it forced onto us and we started using it, we realized that actually it's a pretty good way of uh, thinking about a stream of future events. Uh, this one is my favorite one. Uh, so I'm just, just going to have a drink uh, for a moment. Someone's have a croaking throat throughout the whole presentation. Um, Acker actors. So, the stuff I'm telling you here isn't really Acker specific. It applies to any actor system, but Acker is the kind of the big actor implementation on the JVM. When you, um, if you talk about kind of things in traditional object-oriented programming, you think about sending messages, like in small talk jargon. In actors, you talk about sending messages too, but the key difference is that you don't wait for the response. You just say, "I'm going to throw a message to you, and I'm going to go off and do something else. Good luck de dealing with it." And this is actually quite a massive advantage because, for example, if you want to do something, you can't block by definition because you send a message, something that does it on your behalf, and then if it wants to get back to you, it has to send you a message and then you have to receive a message when you're ready to receive them. So this kind of forces you into an interesting paradigm. The other interesting thing is that when you do message passing rather than shared memory, when you don't have countdown latches or synchronized blocks, you get all this distributed programming free of charge. 
because you have two ACR actors running on your system, and then you can say, well, we've got concurrency, it's working great, uh, but we want to put it onto two machines now because we're hitting limits of what we can do with vertical scaling. And with a traditional solution with countdown latch or synchronized block, you can't really do that because they have to be on the same JVM. Uh, with actors, they're using messaging. So of course you can do that over the network. So then you just pick up an actor, put it onto a different JVM, set up a bit of remote configuration, and Bob's your uncle, you have a kind of small distributed setup going on. Um, so they are in some ways kind of like small microservices. They're kind of like, uh, act, you know, the similarities between microservices and actors can't be ignored. And I think that partially comes from the lineage of Erlang. The other really nice thing about actors is that you can also have actors supervising other actors. And then if actors crash, a supervisor can then say, whoops, that's died, we need to pick that back up. A bit like system D on Linux, if any of you do DevOps. Um, and this is really advantageous because we can do unit tests, we can do types, we can do every single good developer practice, but that ain't gonna save you against a Java IO exception because you have a failing hard drive platter on your server, right? You're always gonna have errors that you did not anticipate and you need ways of handling un unanticipated errors. So rather than trying to program, trying to defensively stop any bad thing from happening, it's easier to write an architecture where you accept errors going to happen and you have a reasonable strategy for how you're going to deal with it. Uh, the most common strategy is to do exponential back off where you restart something and if it keeps failing, then you slow down the extent to which you restart it. Again, all of this is like Erlang stuff, um, but Akka does a really good implementation of it. I'd highly recommend it. Um, so we decided to start playing around with actors at Qdini. And going back to the gentleman's previous talk about Gitflow, uh, we also use Gitflow ourselves. So we made an internal tool which gives you a web UI of all the branches we currently have. And then you can update a branch by pressing the plus button. And then you can vis visit the branch. And it takes about two minutes, three minutes to launch. Um, and this entire thing is entirely written on actors. Um, each build, when you launch a new branch, has to rebuild it so you get a new version. And obviously, we don't want to recopy the whole base template directory every time because it takes too much time. So we have a directory pool that's an actor. Uh, all the WebSocket connections um, are kind of based on WebSocket uh, actors as well. You can also do good old-fashioned scheduled interval batch jobs. So we kind of pull our directory because I'm too lazy to write a Bitbucket plugin to push things to us. So we just pull it instead. And we do that with an actor, tracking running builds, queuing builds, it's all there. And yeah, actors, uh, I have to say, out of all the paradigms we've used so far, actors was probably the easiest one, albeit a bit verbose in places, but that's because we're using Java. Um, and we're not yet taking advantage of remote actors. So we could decide, for example, hey, unlike Bamboo, wouldn't it be great if on our rapid branch system, we could actually have the building on a different server to the thing that's tracking all the builds, branches, and all of the running systems. And with remote actors, we could theoretically do it, although we'll see, because we, I haven't actually tried that yet. Now, all this is all well and good, you know, rainbows and unicorns, yay, let's all go to actors and go home, but sadly, it's not that simple. Um, every single system I've given you so far uses asynchronous APIs. It doesn't matter whether you're using old school callbacks, whether you're using async awaits, whether you're using promises, it doesn't matter. They all have the same fundamental problem. Number one, if you're using promises, like, this is not that readable, is it, really? Um, we, can, we can pretend it's readable, but it's not. If we were to write this synchronously using a thread, they'd be like about half the size. The, like the then applies over there are basically the new semicolon. You know, it's, it's just verbose. Um, better than using callbacks to be sure, but not a big enough improvement for my taste. Thanks Java, that stack trace is really useful. That really tells me what problem I'm having. Um, this is the other one with async code. The truth is when you abandon threads, you're taking a very useful piece of abstraction, which is the notion of a task running over time. What you're doing is you're taking that thread and you're slicing it up into little pieces and then scattering it over an event loop, which is why you lose all of your context when things goes wrong. Um, so it's not, you know, there are problems with this approach. We've seen great performance improvements, but like most developers, when I see this, I put on a brave face and I pretend as if I know what's going on. I don't know what's going on. Like, I, I just grep the stack for things that have com.qd at the beginning. Um, yeah, it's not great. This is by the only one page. Uh, there are several more of these pages. It's not great. And I'm, I'm not picking on Reactor here. This is a problem you get with most async frameworks, sadly. Um, it's, just, it's a problem inherent to the paradigm rather than a problem of any particular library. So two more constructs people use to handle concurrency a lot. Um, on the left here, we have Kotlin using coroutines. On the right, we have JavaScript using await async. And before any of you say this is JVM roundabout, uh, we do have Nation on the JVM, which runs JavaScript. Uh, I don't know if it supports a, a rate async, but it does support promises. So do coroutines solve the problem? 
And the answer is, if you had like Lua coteins or coteins on like uh, uh, underlimited continuations, it would be great, but Codelin sadly does, doesn't have that, and that isn't due to a limitation of Codelin. Codelin guys do a great job, but the runtime you work on has to support um, underlimited uh, coteins properly, otherwise you still have this problem where, great, it looks nice, but what if you want to call that um, non-blocking function? And the answer is, well, if you want to call it, the function itself also has to be a coteen. Okay, and what about the function calling that? Oh, well, gee, I guess we have to go there and make that a co co coteen as well. And then you're like, okay, but this coteen is called by a third-party library. What do we do now? And then you just shrug and go home. Uh, it's this kind of non-blocking thing cascades down the whole tech stack. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're using coteens, doesn't matter if you're using even a weight async, doesn't really solve the problem. When you, we had this thing with rapid branch where I wanted processes to be async, so I made them async, and then I ended up having to literally rewrite the return type of every single type in about 50 or different methods because it cascaded downwards. Um, and this is a serious pro problem with this paradigm. Um, and the weight async is syntactical sugar for promises, um, but it doesn't really solve the fundamental problems, even though admittedly it does look a lot better. So we're Java programmers, we're on the JVM, what do we do about it? Well, we steal ideas, that's what we, what we should do. Any good idea that isn't nailed onto the floor, we should steal. A common saying by Go programmers is, don't communicate by sharing memory, share memory by communicating. We should see what, other, what works for other languages and we should steal them. And that leads us to this, Project Loom. Now, Project Loom is no guarantee this feature is going to get in. This is a proposal by the Open JDK team. And uh, so I'm just checking my time. OK, I'm good. I can actually slow down a bit now. Um, Project Loom is trying to get fibers and continuations on the Java virtual machine. And the idea here is that when you have these, you could take Spring MVC, and I'm not saying this is really doable, but theoretically, you could take Spring MVC, and you could make it non-blocking without forcing users to learn a whole new reactive Spring stack. So if they had fibers, they, they could have just said, OK, we're going to launch our request in fibers instead, and then when it goes to do I.O., we're going to <coughs> cause it to yield. And then all of the APIs in between that, all of your code, your client code, wouldn't have to be changed. Um, the idea being that when it blocks, like in Go or Erlang, it's not a big deal, it just waits. And then the underlying runtime will just unpark it and then just kind of do a user land switch and then just move over to some, something else. Because the reason we went over to non-blocking and concurrency and stuff is because uh, threads, kernel threads are expensive. They're expensive when you block. So what some systems do, like Go and Erlang, is they try to implement threads in the user land and they do it really quickly, which means you can actually wait for things and it's not prohibitive at all. You can do it on large scale. And as you can see in Java, they're seriously considering doing this. And in fact, um, if you scroll down to the bottom of this, the guy, I can't remember his name, he's the guy behind the Quasar project, which is really cool. Um, he gives a long reason why they're not just taking a rate async from C Sharp. They're saying that they're doing this because they think this is the better approach and uh, they think it will scale better. Uh, to wrap up with, I guess we'll just have to do really long questions. Um, putting aside hypothetical future lightweight things like fibers and everything, if you want to go home now and actually start working on something right now, and you want to do um, concurrency that works across microservices, distributed message brokers are a really obvious approach, um, but they're already covered in several other talks, so I didn't want to go into them again. Reactive streams are really good. Um, RX Java, Project Reactor, both great implementations. Uh, we use Project Reactor just because Spring told us to, basically. Um, Acker actors, I gotta say, out of this bunch, my favorite are actors. Um, actors work great because they're essentially mini microservices in their own right. And completable future, you know, I said about all of its problems and I spoke about how powerful actors and reactive streams are, but completable future still serve a really important use, which is that they are now the standard way of composing asynchronous effects on the JVM. And so they are effectively going to become the bridge through which all other concurrency libraries will now communicate um, because they're easier to use in Java 7 future or uh, callbacks. Uh, thanks for listening.